We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal. The following is an introduction to one of the many, many women who fought hard over 72 years before gaining the right to vote in 1920. One example of their fight occurred in late 1917 on a night that was later dubbed the Night of Terror, when 33 suffragettes were arrested while picketing outside the White House and later beaten and tortured while in custody. As news of this spread, it helped to galvanize public support of the suffrage movement. It wasn't the end of the struggle, though. Women have continued to strive for equal treatment over the last 100 years, and gains have been made thanks to women such as Eleanor Roosevelt, Gloria Steinem, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Not all men were against the women's suffrage movement. There were those that even marched with the women in support of their cause. Carrie Chapman Catt, probably the most famous Iowan associated with the women's suffrage movement, was born in 1859 in Wisconsin and grew up near Charles City, Iowa. A feminist from her earliest school days, she was responsible for creating a women's physical education program at Iowa State Agricultural College now ISU, from which she graduated in 1880. She succeeded Susan B. Anthony as president of the National Woman Suffrage Association. She took up the pursuit of child labor laws, was act actively involved in peace movements during both world wars, protested against Hitler's persecution of the Jews in the early 1930s, well before the war began, and after World War II, worked on behalf of disarmament. Carrie died in 1947, 27 years after women won the right to vote. It's easy to imagine that the enfranchisement of the American woman simply arrived. Like some evolutionary imperative, a natural step in the gradual march of progress, or maybe as a gift bestowed by wise men upon their daughters, wives, and sisters. Or maybe women just asked politely, staged a few picturesque marches, hoisted a few picket signs, and without much drama, votes for women was achieved. That is not how it happened. The struggle for women's suffrage was long and bitter fight. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, women were condemned from the pulpit and the press for thinking about suffrage. They were spit upon and pelted with rotten eggs if they spoke about it, and they were jailed for demanding it. Finally, in 1918, the 19th Amendment was passed by the House of Representatives, but not by the Senate. I urged all suffragists to press on and lobby their senators. And through their hard work, a year later, it passed the Senate. But we had our work cut out for us then. We had to get 33 fourths of the then 48 states to ratify the to ratify the amendment. That was 36 states, and our opponents only needed to get 13 states to defeat us. It is not to be underestimated how hard and how long women worked to get the vote. 16 states had already granted women the right to vote, so we turned our attention to those states that hadn't. With much hard work, in March of 1920, we had 35 of the required 36 states 
and our opponents had six of their needed 13. We descended on Tennessee where the governor was anti-suffragist. But we had finally gotten President Wilson's backing because he was worried about his own re-election with so many states now allowing women to vote. I wrote to a dear friend four days before arriving in Tennessee. I told her, there is not a ghost of a chance of us winning the ratification in Tennessee. But upon arrival in Tennessee, I put on my best smile. The press surrounded me and I said, Tennessee is the queen of the Southern states and the leader in all progressive matters. Tennessee will rise to the occasion and use its decisive vote for women. The eyes of the country and the world are centered here in Nashville. I am telling you, never in the history of politics has there been such a force of evil. Strange men and men, groups of men, they just sprang up. Men we had never met before during battle. Men were promising money to legislators who would vote against the suffrage amendment. Opponents tried to sway lawmakers with alcohol, thinking that, well, a drunken legislator will be easier to manipulate. They even encouraged legislators to move, leave town and they offered to pay their expenses. They flooded Tennessee with the most outrageous literature, outright lies, innuendo, and more dangerous, near truths. And the race issue reared its ugly head. Opponents unpacked the old chestnuts. Women were too emotional, too high strung, inclined to hair pulling spats. They even said that any working woman was a loose woman. And opponents focused on me, making me the living symbol of all that was alien and evil, ungodly and un-American. I found myself vilified by distinguished clergymen and high-minded men. Women were not to speak in public, so my suffrage meetings were called promiscuous gatherings. When the amendment finally came to a vote on August 18th, no one was sure who was going to win. We brought in one pro-suffrage legislator from the hospital so he could vote. And we convinced another who was headed home to be with a sick child to turn away from the rail station and stay for the vote. But there was a young Republican who came to vote and he was wearing a red rose. And that signified that he was anti-suffragist. But he was carrying a letter from his mother in his pocket. And the letter in part said, hurrah and vote for suffrage. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat put rat in ratification. Well, unfortunately, when they were voting whether or not to table the motion, he voted with the anti-suffragists, causing a tie. And we thought all was lost. But then they did a final roll call vote and he voted with his mother and with us. We won by one vote. <sighs> that vote is the emblem of your equality. Women of America, the guarantee of your liberty. That vote of yours has cost millions of dollars and thousands of lives of women. 
women have suffered agony of soul, which you never can comprehend, that you and your daughters might inherit political freedom. That vote has been costly. Prize it. The vote is power, a weapon of offense and defense, and a prayer. Use it intelligently, conscientiously, and prayerfully. Progress is calling you to make no pause. Vote. Carrie Chapman Catt fought for her right to vote, so honor her courage and exercise your right to vote regardless of your gender. Please make sure to view the stories of all three women we are presenting in this series.